Good evening. I'm Travis Shaddix. Welcome to Turf Grass Epistemology. I'm glad you're here. It's going to be a fun evening. I uh, see we already have a lot of stuff going on in chat this evening. I love to see that. It is official. The channel has now memberships available and as a as a note of potential future trivia, Turf Nerd Lawn Care was the first person to become a member of the channel. Thank you, Turf Nerd Lawn Care. Lawn Care. Chuck Benzing was the second in Super TA. And it's probably only a matter of when they logged in. <laughs> they just happened to log in. Andrew Burris, thank you so much. I'm going to go over the memberships tonight and explain what it is I'm planning on doing and how any memberships will go directly to support turfgrass research. So I will go over all that this evening, and we have a really good episode and a really good article to go over. Maybe one of the most important potassium articles that I'll, that I'll go over in, the, in this month, probably. It's one of the most um, st one of the strongest articles, one of the strongest research um, projects, and very compelling conclusions. So I'm going to go over that tonight. But let me say hello to, hi to everybody. Um, Internet surfer, turf aficionados. Yes, we are. Gardener Earth guy, Gardener Earth guy. I love you. I know you really want to have some CEUs but I really want to maintain my sanity. <laughs> so I will make anybody on the channel a deal. If you want to take responsibility for filling out all the forms for CEUs for members and to return those CEUs and take responsibility for making sure everybody gets the CEU points, then I will give you a free membership. Okay. <laughs> no problem. The CEUs I've, I've seen my, uh, my better days with CEUs and now I'm dealing with, potentially 50 different states and um it's a little more than i want to take on right now so but if anybody is so compelled to take that responsibility and own it you have my complete um, authorization to do so and i will help you get started in any way connecticut cubonican good evening gray fox cvo hobo that's the second funnest name to say i can't remember what was the first there was a name the other night that was real fun to say can't remember now what it was, but that you you take you take second prize because there was one that was fun funner than that one to say. Reed Grieven. I wish I knew how to pronounce your last name. Reed, if it's Grevin or Grieven, I, I don't want to mispronounce your name. But good evening, Roberto Gonzalez. Interested in my opinion of the Texas A&M extension recommending four one two ratio in the spring and high K in the fall. And then Miggity is, says hello. So I'll give you my opinion. Roberto Gonzalez, if you want my opinion, for what it's worth. Remember, opinions are like, I'll say belly buttons. There's another anatomical feature that usually is used with this saying, but opinions are like belly buttons. Everybody has one, and they all stink except mine. So I don't know what my opinion is worth, but I'll give it to you. The 412 ratio is um, a um, carryover from some past research in other areas of turf grass science that where there's publications that show that that ratio tends to be an efficient ratio. But generally speaking, that ratio is, is used by or recommended by uh, extension personnel who have not yet conducted, you know, site specific research. So if if they have conducted site specific research and yet they still recommend a 412 then they probably have a good reason for it but in most cases including even in florida for a long time the 412 ratio was, was recommended and you might even see some still some old publications recommend that at you at florida and there, there was an old publication that found that that was a valid um efficient ratio even in i think it was I think it was in Fort Lauderdale. It might have been by Dr. Broshad. I can't remember, or Dr. Elliott. I can't remember who did one years and years ago. But um, as we've progressed in our discipline, we've determined um, more convincingly that the potassium is oftentimes unnecessary and the phosphorus is also oftentimes unnecessary unless you are um, seeing a turf grass deficiency in those areas, phosphorus or potassium. 
or unless you've had a pre-existing deficiency um, and now you're attempting to um, maintain a certain level of phosphorus or potassium to no longer have that deficiency. So it's, it's kind of similar to like the human body a little bit. Like if you, if you don't have um, chronic pain, then there's no need to take painkillers. Right. Um, if you don't have some types of cancer, then there's no need to take chemotherapy. So if you don't have a phosphorus deficiency, then there's no need to apply phosphorus. If you don't have a potassium deficiency, there's no need to apply potassium. And so the 412, in my opinion, is my understanding, I could be wrong, um, that it's, it was, well, I know it was published years ago and there's some evidence to support that, but today we've learned more since then and, and generally it's no longer, generally it's accepted that the phosphorus and potassium are um, either unnecessary or if they're recommending it, I'm assuming that they've determined that it is necessary, okay? But usually it's not. Yeah, tur turf grass responses to potassium are few and far between. And that reminds me, I'm going to show you in a minute when I go onto the channel. <laughs> I watched a video today that was just fantastic. But I, I'm not going to show it because I'm, tr I'm trying to be kind here, people. I'm trying to be very professional and kind. Even if people don't know and they're, they're recommending wrong things, I give them the benefit of the doubt that they're just naive and they don't know. They're not doing it in some sort of nefarious fashion. But I watched a video today that just cracked me up. And uh, sometime when I, when I get around to it, I'll, I'll show it. But I took a picture of me watching it today and I posted it in the members channel. Let's get to it. I got a little bit to go over tonight. But th thank you all for showing up tonight. I really appreciate it. We're going to have fun tonight. And uh, the memberships are open. I'll get to that in just a minute. But uh, before we get, oh, you know what? Let me get to the membership now, actually, because I'm doing this in back, backward order here. Hang on one second. Let me get to the memberships um, thing that I wanted to do now. That would make sense. And then I'll get back to what I was going to do in a minute with some, some potassium. So the memberships are open. It's $5 a month for the entry level and $10 a month for the pro level. And I've set it up such that if you're going, and I've changed the Calendly. I changed the price on the Calendly to $100 a month. So if you're going to do a Calendly appointment with me, or you anticipate doing that, then there's really no reason to not be at the pro level on YouTube. Let me explain why. I've arranged it such that the pro level on YouTube is $10 a month, so it's $120 a year, but you get essentially a free Calendly appointment every year. So instead of paying $100, I have to charge $1. I can't, the Calendly won't let me do it for free. So if you're a pro member, then you get one Calendly um, appointment every year for essentially free. And then every other one after that is still $50. You don't pay the, the non-member price of $100. So if you're entry level at $5 a month, then you get the, price, the, um, the Calendly appointment for $50. But if you're going to do a Calendly appointment, you might as well just do the pro level because you get another $50 off anyway doing, doing the pro level. So... It, at the end of the day, you have to decide that the pro level, what you're going to get is a free Calendly invitation, a free Calendly consultation every year. And then you're going to get access to the Zoom meetings. I'm going to do a Zoom meeting periodically with the pro members. And all it is is just us chit-chatting. It's not recorded. It's not broadcast. Um, it's it's just, you know, open discussion. I might, I might come with a topic. You might come with a topic. There may be one person with me there. There may be 50 people with me there. And it's just an open roundtable about what's going on in turf grass what's working for people in different areas of the nation or the world, just different, different topics that we can just openly and fairly discuss without any judgment or anything, uh, anybody feeling bad about thinking they're asking a silly question or anything like that. It's just, it's, so it's an opportunity to just have a frank discussion and fair discussion about, about things in turf grass management. And I'll do that periodically and probably once every month or once every other month with the pro members. So if you don't want to do the zoom meeting and you're not going to do a Calendly invite, then just do the entry level and that's fine. But if you're going to do a Calendly, you might as well do the pro member, the pro level. Okay. So let me get to that. And so this is what it's going to look like. So I've already posted a lot of stuff on the membership page. <laughs> so this is the, the main page of, of my website. And if you go to the membership, um, well, I guess it's, this is what it looks like to you guys. Um, it's going to have a variety of different things I've already posted. Like this is the link. You know, I'm not going to click on this cause it has the link for the Calendly discounted prices, but you can click on this and see the Calendly, um, uh, web or URL, and you would want to use that for your Calendly appointments. It's not visible to anybody except through that link. So no one else can see it except for the people who click on this link and, and, 
and copy and paste that into the website or the, uh, the web browser. And then I posted this this morning. This was me watching that video this 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 afternoon. I was so I was so just it was so much fun watching it. And I I, I post some stuff. I'll post some personal stuff about myself if you guys are interested in that. But I'll have a variety of personal things I'll put on there. And then all the videos that I've already posted that aren't open to the public yet, or you guys will be able to watch it. So you can see there's 10 or 15 videos that have already been loaded um, that I haven't been released yet. I'm gonna re They're releasing about one a day. I think all the way through like the middle of April, there'll be the little short videos that I put out are already open for members. And you can count through there, whatever there are, 10 or 15 videos on there that, um, that are available to you now if you want to go watch those. And they won't be available to the public for you know several weeks. And then here's some picture of my backyard where I had a couple of trees fall. And I still can't quite figure out what's going on there with those two spots. This A tree fell here. Actually, the next photo over, you can see where this tree crushed my house. And right here was where that tree was. And I'm not exactly sure why I can't get anything to grow there. And here's where the other cherry tree was here. And I'm having a lot of difficulty with that. If anybody can uh, provide me any input on why I can't get anything to grow where there once was a 60-year-old black cherry, I would appreciate it. But um, that's what's behind the, the membership wall now. A bunch of videos and some personal posts from me. And I bought some fertilizer for $4,400 a ton. And just, I don't even know. I didn't even know that was possible to do. <laughs> I took a soil test from a commercial soil test online, uh, whatever you call it, soil test service. And they recommended a fertilizer. And that's part of a project I'm doing. And the cost was $4,400 a ton. That's absolutely insane. I don't know who would pay for that, but I guess homeowners are paying for that. So anyway, so that's a little bit about the uh, the membership. And what I'm planning on doing is, pro is something very, I, I think it's very different. I could be wrong. As soon as I say this, someone will point out five different times where it's happened in the past. But um, the what I'm planning on doing with the revenue from the channel and right now there's really not well i've had several members already tonight so there's already some some revenue coming in from the memberships tonight and i appreciate that what i'm planning on doing just so everybody understands is that i'm going to one pay for the cost of doing this there's a little bit of overhead that i got to pay for and i have to reimburse my wife <laughs> for all these little things that i need to get this show on the air but after that my my intention is this any revenue left over is going to go directly to the turfgrass research projects that I'm doing. I, I have one or two projects that I do. I've been doing for on and off for a while, and I still dabble in research occasionally. But I pay for all that, and it comes out of my pocket to do that. And so what I thought I would try to do is use the revenue from this channel to help pay for the expenses of things like buying. I have to buy. I don't own a push lawnmower. I mow my lawn with a robot mower, but I need a push lawnmower to collect. Uh, turf grass clippings for research. You know, I need little instruments. You know, I, ha I have most of them, but I need to pay for soil sample analysis. And I've got to pay $1,500 to get a, uh, the research published and so forth. And another $1,500 if you want to get it public um, open access. So there's a number of expenses that go along with doing research. And my thought was, if, if there's whatever revenue there is after paying for the expenses of actually having the channel on the air, I would use to support the research that I do. And in the publications, you'll notice, in fact, the one publication I have tonight might have one on here too. The, throughout, throughout the, uh, there, yeah. So at the end of some of these publications, there'll be acknowledgements for funding and they'll list a number of different people who supported the projects and associations that supported the research and so forth. And if, the funding for this channel goes into supporting the research. My and I don't. I'm not making any commitment to this right now. I, I need to figure out exactly, you know, what this means. But what I would like to look into try to do is that at the bottom of these publications. So, for example, the um, the soil testing um, research project that I'm doing right now. If the channel supports that then I will acknowledge that support in the actual scientific publication under the acknowledgements. So I would say, for example, at the end of today's publication, it says acknowledgements. The authors are grateful for the following people who contributed to this project over the years. And I would list with your authorization, with your, you know, assuming that you would allow me to do this, I would list your name and their acknowledgement. So essentially I'm trying to, I'm thinking about crowdsourcing 
research for turf grass science, at least the research that I'm doing. Because right now, my, my wife and I are paying for all this, and I'm going to continue to pay for it. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm wired this way. I'm going to keep doing research. But with this channel kind of growing and it being centered heavily on research and evidence, I thought it would be interesting to see if the channel would, would um, the revenue from this channel could support that. Okay. So if that's um, something that's of interest to you all, and if that's sort of compelling to contribute to the channel, think of it as you're really contributing to turf grass research. If that, if that's what floats your boat, that's kind of where I'm going with it. Okay. I don't know what's going to happen, but we'll, <laughs> if it works out, it'll work out and we'll see. Gray Fox, thank you for your entry level membership. Danny Hayes. I don't remember that name, Danny. I apologize. I don't remember that name, but thank you very much for being a member. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, Let's go back into the, the chat. Um, Grevin. Okay, read Grevin. Thank you for, that's a perfect way to say it, seven. And we all know how to make seven and e even, right? It's a sixth grade joke. We all know how to make seven even. You just remove the S. So, um, the Garden Earth guy. Uh, okay, so please show, oh, Francis Cut Lawn Care, you want me to show the the, the the video i'll show it eventually but you have to understand my 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 therapist um, moved into a different area of psychiatry or, or mental health therapy and so i'm still looking for another therapist i don't <laughs> i don't want to go down these roads too far before i uh, have some you know mental coaching so to make my way through it because some of it is so depressing and so just it's just uh, makes me want to vomit even even watching it but um, but I think it would be useful and I'm trying to be kind, but I'm, I think it would be useful as an example to show what exists in the, in the YouTube's, you know, social media sphere now relative to what actually is true. But I got to, I got to be in a, a, the correct mental state to actually show that stuff and get through it. I'll, I'll get there. I'll get there. And, um, I will show a video on uh, Monday or Tuesday. I was going to show it tonight, but it's more relative to, um, potassium with structural components of turf grass. So I'm not going to show that, and I'll show it Monday or Tuesday. Princess Cut Lawn says, do I plan on doing any DIY content in the lawn? If I do, it will be under the, it'll, I'll post it in the membership uh, community tab of my channel. And if there's enough interest in that, then maybe I'll post it on the public videos or whatever. Uh, I, I don't really do DIY content. I mean, I don't know why everybody's so interested in me, my DIY, my lawn, seeing my lawn. I'm, I'm not sure. Um, but I just have an average lawn. I don't have anything fancy. I just have an average lawn with average weeds and average looking turf grass. It's nothing particular fan particularly fancy. Um, but I do, do, I do a lot of things. I'm redoing a side deck this year. That'll be a project. And, um, I redid my whole lawn. I took out 29 trees in the last five years and I've redone, I've redone my lawn two or three times during that time period, uh, but I never documented or took any pictures of it. So a lot of it's kind of on cruise control now. So the answer to your question, Princess Cut Lawn Care, is I, 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 if I do, I'll put it in the community tab, but I, I don't have any intention. But I will say this, if the members are so inclined to really encourage me to do that, then I would, I would consider you know, doing that if there's such an interest. Um, again, I, I don't know what I would do. I mean, I'm just out there with a robot mower and I spread fertilizer maybe once a year. Every, sometimes I don't spread any fertilizer at all the entire year. I spray my lawn once or twice a year for pre-emergent herbicide or weeds. But that's it. Most of my time in the lawn is spent fixing cut wires from my auto mower. <laughs> that's it, honestly. I was outside today with my neighbor trying to fix his wires on his auto mower that got cut. So um, I, uh, I don't spend a whole lot of time doing maintenance now. I spend a lot of time relaxing and enjoying the lawn now. CBO Hobo says it's a great idea. Thank you. Uh, Western Mass Turf, how does one become a member? I think you just go to the channel and I think there's a join button. I think. Um, if I'm not mistaken, there's like a button. Yeah, so if you've already subscribed, I think you would hit subscribe and then I think maybe a join button pops up. And then when you hit join, I'm, I'm saying this like I know what I'm talking about. I don't know what I'm talking about. But you, there, there should be a join button there and then you'll go through the process of signing up whatever level you want. 
And just remember, if you're going to do a Calendly invite, there's no point in doing the entry level. You might as well just do the pro level because you'd get a, it would pay for itself immediately. Okay, so I want to make sure that's clear before people don't realize that and they realize they wanted to do a pro level. They should have done a pro level anyway. Uh, permission granted. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, Gardner Earth Guy, 29 trees. Did I get CEUs for that? No. But when I was in Florida, I owned about five acres just uh, just west of southwest of Gainesville, and I took down a couple of trees that were just old, rotten trees. And, this, and some, my neighbor called the local, uh, DEP. And I was like, what do you, what do you, they're old, they're half rotten dead trees. And, but there was some law against it. Right. And when I can't, and so I had to plant some other trees, it was fine, which I was going to plant some other trees anyway, that were, you know, more healthy trees. And so when I came here, there was about 34 or 35 trees on a, on 0.3 acres. And now I have about four or five or six left. And when, when I, well, before I took the first one down, I had the arborist come in and I'm used to Florida where everybody's nose is everybody's business. And I came here and I said, uh, I'd like to this, take this. It was a black locust. I said, I'd like to take this black locust down. It looks like it's half dead. He goes, yeah, sure. And I said, well, is there any rule against this? Or is there anything I need to know about before we take this down? And he looked at me kind of funny and he goes, what do you mean? And I go, well, in Florida, I got the DEP called on me because I removed trees. And he goes, Travis, this is Kentucky. <laughs> I'm like, okay. I just like, you know, I'll, I'll take it. So, um, most of the trees, every tree except one was actually either diseased or rotten in the, in the core. There was one healthy tree, which is a hackberry. There was one hackberry that was healthy. All the, all the other trees were either diseased or rotten or cracked or hit, hit by lightning or something else. They just never took care of it. And they no, nobody ever removed them. Uh, Esteban Campos, I don't, it says, I don't see the button in my cell phone. Does it have to be in a desktop computer only? Well, let's look at my cell phone. Um, I don't know the answer to that. I would think that it would show up on your phone, but I don't know. A, I don't see it either, but I'm the owner of the account, so maybe it doesn't show up on mine. So you're right, Espan Complex. I don't see it on mine, so maybe you have to wait till it's on a desktop version and you can do join by that. Okay, so let's get started, but just keep in mind, that's my intent. Well, I'm going to use any revenue for Turfgrass Research, but my intent beyond that is, is, it, is that I will send an email or contact you to say, when, once a publication gets published, which is now, once seems like once every two or three years, I was publishing five a year for a long time, but now it's once every two or three years. If you want you to be, to be acknowledged on the uh, publication, then I would be willing to, as long as I'm legally allowed to, I'd be willing to acknowledge your contribution to that research on the scientific paper, okay? Okay, let's get started. And I, I want to get into this paper because I don't want to rush through it. And it's a ridiculously important paper. If I can get this off of here without shutting the whole show down. Okay, this paper is entitled uh, the, A Long-Term Evaluation of Differential pa Potassium Fertilization cre uh, of Creeping Bentgrass Putting Green. Now, don't hang up just because it's a putting green because this information in here, if you're not in golf, don't hang up. Because the, the information in here is going to be extremely relevant to any soil turf situation. Okay. Oh, and before we, okay, so just real quick, before we get there, let's go to the scoreboard. Okay. The scoreboard is the turf grass response to applied potassium. Right now we have one, two, three, four, five articles that I, I thought I went over more than five, but let's say I have five articles on here that I've gone over with potassium. And we have a column that says positive response no response or a negative response. And we have all five of those articles uh, concluded somewhere in their, in their publication that no response was measured. Four of those five articles that I've gone over so far, including Fitzpatrick Chick Gillard, the Ebden 2013 paper, Johnson 03 and the Waddington 72 paper, all four of them noted there was at least something about the turf grass that was found to be harmful. There was a negative response. And three of them, Ebden, Waddington, and Sartain, all also found a positive response, and they also all happened to be on yield. And all of them happened to be on low-case soils. They were on low-case soils, and it was only with yield. But even in the studies where there was a, a positive response on yield, they did not report a positive response to turf grass quality. Okay, so the scoreboard is three in the positive, which were just on yield, five in the none, and four in the negative. So we're having a negative effect, a harmful effect to the turf grass 
as a result of applying potassium on four of these studies so far. And tonight we're going to go over a study that has Malik-3 in 23 parts per million. Which if you know anything about Malik-3, um, that is usually considered quite low. Okay? Let me go to here now, and I will start back up on the article. So now, the article is titled, A Long-Term Evaluation of Differential Potassium Fertilization of a Creeping Bentgrass Putting Green by Peter Beer, Beer Beyer. I don't know how to pronounce his last name. I don't know how to pronounce this last name either. Perch, Percy, and then Paul Koch and Doug Soldat. So Paul is an extremely respected and well-good pathologist. And of course, everybody knows Doug Soldat. He's, he's the more intelligent, better looking version of me. <laughs> that's the way I like to use it. That's the way I like for now or to introduce him. Okay, so this study is going to be on um, creeping bent grass. But keep in mind, guys and gals, I want you to think about the... Um, the soil, the soil turf grass system throughout this paper, not just the fact that, oh, it's on a putting green and it's not relevant to me. There's a lot of information in here that's going to be relevant to your backyard. I'm going to get to it. Okay, let's get going. Potassium fertilization has been attributed to enhancement of desirable turf grass traits such as color, density, and winter hardiness. Okay. Diseases like microdochium patch have also been linked to inadequate levels of potassium. For this reason, the use of potassium fertilizers on turf grass, specifically on golf courses, is very popular. Now, there's a little bit there that is a little bit of a leap, but, you know, I'll, I'll take it. Although potassium fertilization use is high on bent grass grown on sand-based root zone putting greens, peer-reviewed literature on the impact of potassium fertilization is far from conclusive. Okay, far from conclusive. And the video that I watched today that I was laughing so hard about was there was a video about some two guys, and I mentioned it before on the channel. It's really, it's not it's not easy for me to get through those videos, but the video was saying about two guys and um, another gentleman. Two the two guys were soil testing guys, and one of the guys was saying, "I'm you know I'm, I've seen so many profound uh, impacts or results from applying potassium. You know, there's such a good response from applying potassium." I'm, I'm like, I'm, "What universe are you in?" Because in the universe that I exist in. That is not even remotely close to the truth. Okay. <laughs> it is it's exceedingly rare to see a response to potassium. And when we do, it's normally on yield. I'm going to show at least two papers that show a response on quality. But we haven't got there yet. Sometimes it's on yield. Most of the time, absolutely nothing happens. And some of the times we have a negative response happen. And Dr. Soldat and his team right at the beginning says peer reviewed literature on the impact of potassium fertilization is far from conclusive. And I could not agree more reports regarding the effect of potassium fertilization on the clipping yield of bent grasses are varied with several studies reporting no significant impact on clipping yields. And he has four citations, three citations for that. And others reporting increases in growth as results of K fertilization. And as you, you know, one of these I've already have on my scoreboard, the Waddington paper, and he has Christian's paper in there as well. So there's a couple that shows an increase in growth. Many show no, no influence on growth. Much like clipping yield, the effect of potassium fertilization on the color and visual quality of bent grass varies widely. Research studies where potassium fertilization had no effect on visual responses of bent grass are numerous. And yet we have folks on YouTube selling fertilizer soil tests and the fertilizer or soil test and the fertilizer go along with them saying, oh, it's potassium. We have a profound response. I've seen such a profound response to applied potassium. It's BS. It's, thir it's Thursday night. Okay. We've got to be get real about this thing. It's complete nonsense. But how do you know? I, I, put it in chat. How do you know as, a, as someone who is a homeowner, who is someone just an average knowledgeable person in, 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 turf and in the world you're not a scientist like you know someone's reading literature day in and day out you're just a normal person how do you know if what he's saying is true or not true he says it on youtube oh it's a profound impact and potassium is such a profound impact how, how do you what do you what do you do tell me what you do in chat because when i read that it's just like right off like water off a duck's back it's just it's bs it just flows right through off me i, I know it's complete nonsense because but i know the literature you know, what do you do if you don't know the literature? 
I, I don't know how you I don't know how a normal person navigates the world of turf grass BS. What do you do? Brady, 419, thank you for your membership. Western Mass Turf, thank you for your membership. I, I, I'm, I'm just so sad when I see these things because I, I, I feel like I want to help you all and, and I, I don't know what else to do. I, I just feel you're so flooded with nonsense. How could you possibly know what's true? I, it, just, it just drives me, drives me nuts. It almost makes me want to cry when I see that stuff. I mean, not because those guys are saying it, it's because the pe people reading that and listening to it are affected by it. Ugh. Other studies have found that potassium fertilization may increase turf color and quality. Now this, uh, you know, these, these papers are, I mean, I, I guess I, you know, Doug Soldot can't really do anything wrong in my book. I mean, he, he's got a free pass on whatever he wants to do. But if, I'd say some of these citations are a little bit iffy, but again, he can, he can get away with what he wants to get away with in my book and he's fine. But uh, I, wouldn't, I, w I wouldn't have a whole lot of confidence in saying that, you know, potassium fertilization has an increase on turf color and quality. It, it, it can happen. And like I said, I'm going to show at least two papers that do that. But it's under specific conditions where the, the turf grass, the, the soil is very low in potassium. And the turf grass is legitimately deficient in potassium, which is exceedingly rare. Okay. Uh, okay, so let's, we're going through the introduction. He goes through the introduction and they do a good job of really laying out a, a lot more information in detail about what they're going to eventually find regarding potassium and uh, mineralization and so forth and what's found in the literature. It says, although tissue potassium content has been observed to increase with increased potassium fertilization, tissue potassium content does not necessarily correlate to increases in color, quality, or clipping yields. And then he goes on to the, through the paragraph here and cites Destin Gallard, which I will go over the Destin Gallard paper, which is awesome. It doesn't quite, yeah, well, it, it, I think that's a, the International Turf Grass Journal paper, I think, if, if I remember. And then he has the Fulton papers. And I mean, there's just a lot of papers in here that show that just because your potassium in the tissue is X doesn't mean we can predict what the color and the quality and the clipping yield will be. Okay. So it doesn't correlate. The potassium in the tissue is notoriously low in correlation with the quality and the color and the clipping yields and so forth. Okay. I'm going to continue through the introduction. Yeah, I'm going to continue through the introduction and then I'll take a little bit of a break and read the chat. Although previous research indicates potassium has little influence on many turf grass characteristics. <laughs> Let me read that again. Although previous research indicates potassium has little influence on many turf grass characteristics, potassium has been shown to have beneficial effects in terms of disease for creeping bent grass. Now, you've heard me, and then even in this paper, this paper tonight, you're going to see um, potassium has influence on disease. So you've heard me talk about potassium actually can increase disease. And I might have already shown one paper. I can't remember if I'm, uh, no, I haven't shown one. Uh, I can't remember if I've shown the papers yet that increase disease, but I will. Um, but I've mentioned it. However, it is possible in some cases where the addition of potassium may actually alleviate some diseases. And he has a couple of citations for that in this paper. Potassium has been shown to have beneficial effects in terms of disease for creeping bent grass. De France in 1938 found during a five-year study of colonial creeping in Piper Velvet Bentgrass Putting Greens in Rhode Island, the application of zero potassium resulted in the highest incidence of brown patch, whereas the application of two, four, six, seven pounds of potassium resulted in the lowest. But these findings are not universal. The Waddington 78 paper reported that brown patch increased numerically, but not significantly as potassium fertilization rates increased on a stand of creeping bent grass. So he has one paper from 1938 that shows there might be a reduction in brown patch. But then there's another paper that shows there's the brown patch increased. So, you know, it's not conclusive to say the least that the addition of potassium is going to alleviate some sort of disease stress okay there's well there's clearly cases but it depends on the, the turf it depends on which disease you're trying to minimize the risk of we're going to talk about that a little bit in here tonight 
The objective of the study was to investigate potassium fertilization requirements of creeping bentgrass putting greens on sand-based root zones. Researchers hypothesized that removing potassium by harvesting clippings for several years would result in a potassium deficiency symptom in tissue potassium and malic 3 soil test values would be useful for predicting when potassium deficiency would occur. And that's a... Well, okay. So that was the objective. We're going to get into materials and methods. Let me see um, CV Hobo. That is the reason why I've joined your channel. Thank you. Okay. That's so how to figure out what's true and what's true, not true. Um, Gray Fox says ditto, basically. I, you know, okay. Faith-based agronomy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, faith-based agronomy, evidence-based evidence-based turf rest management is what I like to use, but faith is the reason. Faith is the word people use when they don't have a good reason. So yeah, faith-based agronomy. You just hear it and believe it, and there you go. Super TA, it's easy to fall victim to the BS as a DOI wire. Not, not no more though. Big thank you. Oh, okay. Well, thanks super TA. People pay $5,000 a ton in hundred, hundred dollar soil tests. Yeah. I just paid $5,000 a ton. Yeah. On, I couldn't believe it. I was like, well, I've only bought one bag, but that's what the price was per ton. I was like, Whoa, <laughs> couldn't believe it. Holy moly. Um, so yeah. Yeah. So I mean, it's easy to be taken advantage of. What are you going to do? I mean, you can't no, you can't be a specialist on everything. What do you, you know? Most of the people in this chat tonight are probably really, really good at one thing in their life. I mean, or two things, but you can't be great at everything. You know, maybe you're extremely good with the guitar, but you don't know how to play a lick of the drums or whatever, you know? And the same thing goes for your world. Maybe you're extremely good at carpentry, but you don't know about turf grass soil testing or whatever the case is. And so, I mean, I get it, you know, but, I just, I mean, I go to YouTube and I learn how to change a spark plug or, you know, clean out a carburetor. Most of that stuff seems pretty good. I learned how to make pizzas better on YouTube, but it seems like when I watch turf grass stuff on YouTube, it's, uh, it's very rare that I find something like, yeah, that guy's, you know, knows what he's talking about. Da, 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 da. It's usually just nonsense. <laughs> like where, where's the, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I just, there's, some, there's some good channels out there. Don't get me wrong. I don't want to say they're all bad. There's some good channels, but whoo, man, that, that one today, it had me laughing. So anyway, you can, if you remember, you can go in there and read what, you know, about a little bit more about my personal challenges and, um, that video helped alleviate some pain. <laughs> okay. Here we go. Materials and methods. This project was initiated on May 30, 31, 2011 at the O.J. Noir Research and Education Facility in Madison, Wisconsin. So if you don't know who O.J. Noir is, he wrote the ABCs of Turf back in 1931 or 19, no, 1927, something like that. He wrote one of the first books of ABCs. It's called ABC of Turfgrass. And in his book, people think that I got sometimes, sometimes people think that I got this water light temperature um, injury and soil fertility pyramid. Some people think that I made that I made the pyramid, but some people think that I made up those, those criteria. I didn't, it came from OJ North's book, like the second or third page in his book of ABCs of turf grass. He has five things listed as the, the risk factors for turf grass growth and development. And it's water, light, temperature, injury, and fertile soil. So they have a, they had a, I mean, obviously he's no longer with us anymore, but, um, that's the OJ Noor research education facility in Madison, Wisconsin. He was the, he was the man for many, many years in Wisconsin, in the world, but he, he worked in Wisconsin. Research was conducted on a putting green surface that was constructed in 2008 with sand meeting USGA specifications for particle size. Pin cross A4 creeping bent grass was seeded at a rate of 98 kilograms per live C per hectare in June of 2008. So we are on a USGA spec green. Uh, with pin with A4 creeping bent grass for those superintendents out there, they know what A4 is. If you don't, no big deal. Just turf. It's creep. Well, it is a big deal for for golf, but don't worry about it if you don't know what it is. Sand from the same origin as the construction sand, which was fines free top dressing sand from why whatever sand whatever this place is, 
was top dressed across the plots to a depth of approximately one millimeter approximately monthly from june through october this is going to become critical so he's he's going to top dress as a normal practice for bent grass green he's going to top dress the putting green all the putting green okay so all the plots that are on that putting green are going to receive top dressing sand at about one millimeter every month between june and october so five millimeters a year which is about um well what is that so 20 like 0.2 inches something like that well what's the math on that so yeah it'd be about 0.2 inches a year something around that number someone can do the conversion i'm just doing it off the top of my head here that's going to be critical at the end they're going to i'm going to explain why that is critical for this for the conclusions nitrogen fertilizer in the form of urea was applied to all plots by bi weekly so every other week at a rate of um, 0.2 pounds of nitrogen for the annual application total of approximately two, uh, two pounds of nitrogen per year. Seems awful low for bent grass. I guess he's in Wisconsin, so two pounds a year for the bent grass. Treatments consist of fertilizers applied bi-weekly every two weeks and were designed to influence potassium availability and included four kilograms, eight kilograms, 24 kilograms of potassium and a non-treated control. So the 24 kilograms is the equivalent of half a pound of K per thousand. And then you can do the conversions down from there. So a half a pound of K per thousand, and then it's whatever that is <laughs> from there. What's eight kilograms? It'd be a tenth of a pound or a little bit less than a tenth of a pound and a little bit less than, see, whatever that conversion is to um, a pound. So hang on, let me just do it real quick. So it'd be 0.16 pounds is eight, and then four divided by 49 is a little less than a tenth of a pound. So a little less than a tenth of a pound up to a half a pound of K in a non-treated control. Now they also included an application of gypsum or potassium sulfate, and they explained why they did this. This treatment was included in the hopes that the calcium would exacerbate the expected potassium deficiency symptoms and control for any effect that the sulfate associated with the potassium sulfate might have, particularly on the microdochium patch, all K was applied as potassium sulfate. So they applied everything as potassium sulfate and they applied calcium sulfate. And you know what I just realized? I have photos of this exact study somewhere. Let me see if I can find the photos. I have this somewhere. Oh, son of a gun. I guess it's right here. Wow, that's lucky. I just got lucky. Okay, so now let's look at what this what this actual um, setup looked like, which should be right here. So this is the setup. They had one pound. Oop, they had one pound of potassium, two pounds of potassium, and six pounds of potassium. Uh, I guess that's annually. And then they had a control, and they had gypsum. Okay, so this gypsum was intended to offset the effects of the sulfate. And then hopefully exacerbate the effect of microdokum by leaching through the potassium. Or I guess that's what he explained, how he explained that. I'll explain that in a sec. I'll go back to that because I don't think I said that correctly. But you can see here from these plots the magnitude of disease. And the disease is on every potassium plot, regardless of the rate. There is more on the six pound uh, potassium plot. But every plot has microdokum on it. But it's far greater on the plots containing or receiving potassium quite high okay so this is we're going to come back to that probably in a, in a minute or two but i want to make sure that's what it that's what it looks like that's what the study looked like and then i want to make sure we're clear on the potassium or the gypsum it was included in the hopes that the calcium was would exacerbate the expected potassium deficiency symptoms okay so they were thinking it'd be potassium deficiency symptoms and that's the reason they applied the calcium to help move that through. That makes sense. Okay. Fertilizer application was made bi-weekly every two weeks for the duration of the growing season, which resulted in annual applications. And then they just said one, two or six pounds of K per year for the, um, for the, where did I see that at? I saw that. Oh, a little less than one, a little less than two and a little less than six. So that, that's what it is. Okay. A golf cart simulator was used six times per week to create stress in the plots. And okay, they're not going to show much information on wear tolerance at all. I don't know really why they have that in the materials and methods other than they just did this to the plots. They don't report any results, I don't think. 
Turfgrass chlorophyll index and visual turf quality was evaluated bi-weekly every two weeks base, basis prior every two week basis base every two weeks <laughs> prior to fertilization. Visual turf grass quality was on a one to nine scale with, with six being the minimum. Soil tests, soil samples were taken monthly during the growing season prior to the bi-weekly fertilizer application. The soil samples were sent to a laboratory where they're analyzed for PK, sulfate, or sulfur, calcium, magnesium, iron, manganese, zinc, copper, and boron through Malik 3. And then they did plant tissue analysis that are collected monthly during the growing season in conjunction with soil sampling. So they have tissue and they have soil. And that's it for their setup. Okay, so let me just explain what they did. They're in Madison, Wisconsin. They did a study for, and they started it in 2011, and they ran it for six years, I think it was. There's, I think it's still going on, if I'm not mistaken. I'm, cre I'm pinned for creeping bent grass. They applied three different levels of potassium as potassium sulfate. They had a non-treated control, and they had gypsum there as well to off offset and balance out the sulfate. They measured soil analysis. They measured tissue analysis. They measured clipping yields, you know, and, they, and they measured uh, quality. Sorry, the quality and the clipping content of these different treatments to see um, if they could induce a potassium deficiency. They wanted to know what, what level of malic would be re required to, you know, recommend, you know, X amount of fertilizer would be needed if the potassium gets down too low and so forth. Okay. Remember they have a non-treated um, product a non-treated plot in here. So they have a plot with no potassium being applied from the fertilizer. <laughs> oh, oh, they also did malic three and they also did a total potassium. And they did total potassium through one normal nitric acid. And total potassium is, is different than malic. Malic is only going to extract a, a portion of it where total is complete boiling of the, of the soil and removal of all potassium forms in the soil. That's going to become important later on. That would never really be useful for any practical purposes, okay? But for their purposes, they needed to because they were seeing some funny stuff. If I can get to the results. Okay. So I'm going to show the results for those statistical nerds like myself in this particular Nova table first. Don't worry for those people who aren't, aren't stats nerds. I'm going to read the results and it's going to make more sense. But I want to read, I want to show the results initially in the Nova table because it's going to be very clear. They presented this in a very clear way. So... Um, what we have here is the effect of clipping yields. We have all the all the sources of variation on the left. We have degrees of freedom, the F ratio, and the probability greater than F on the other on the far right column. What this means is, for those people who are unfamiliar with the stats, when we look at the probability greater than F, we're looking at this column, and this column over here is going to have numbers varying from zero to one, or less. You know, approximately, they're never going to get zero, but very very low to zero to very close to one. The higher the number is, the less confidence we have that we would be correct if they said they differed. The lower the number is, like say, and for this particular example where it says date 0 0.001, that means that we are 99.999% confident that when we say the date affected the clipping yield, that we're correct when we say that. In other words, there was a difference due to date. If the, if the value is... We're going, to, we're going to set the value at 0 0.05, okay? If the, the value is greater than 0 0.05, it doesn't mean they didn't differ. None of these numbers don't mean they didn't differ. It just means that our confidence in saying they differed is very low. We wouldn't say they differed as scientists unless we had a great deal of confidence that we're correct. And so when you see down here, the first uh, clipping yield, we're going to see a 0.5 that the, on the treatment effect. And th what this means is, the, the treatments, the potassium treatments, had no effect on clipping yields. Straightforward. We go to the next one, chlorophyll index, 0 0.98. What that means is the potassium treatments, the application of potassium, had no effect on chlorophyll index. If it was less than 0 0.05, I would say it did differ, and so would they. We keep going down. Visual turf grass quality treatments, these are the potassium treatments. The p-value is 0.94 extremely high, meaning we are very, very confident that saying that there was no difference. They didn't have an effect. Okay. We get down to Malik 3 extractable soil K. Now we see a very low number. 0 0.0001, meaning we're very confident that the application of potassium did influence the Malik 3 extractable potassium. 
All right. Tissue potassium content. See the same thing. We're very confident that the application of potassium increased the, the potassium in the tissue. Keep going. Dollar spot disease. We're very confident that it did not affect dollar spot disease. Pretty confident. Now, these are averaged over three years or over the six years or however many years they did it. I forget what they say. Three years? I think I said six years earlier. I think it's three years. We're very confident that averaged over those years, there was no effect of brown patch disease. But look down here in microdocum patch. 0 0.0001. And it's actually less than that. Less than 0 0.0001. Meaning we are as confident as any scientist could ever be that the application of potassium in this study resulted in an increase in microdochium patch disease. This is coming from a product, potassium, that you can just Google anything in YouTube right now, potassium turf grass, anything you want, and you'll find 15 videos saying, oh, potassium is a stress element. It reduces disease occurrence and reduces heat stress and reduces all this stuff. And I mean, and you're, you're, <laughs> I'm not going to say it would never happen. There's probably some cases in literature where you do see that, but clearly there's evidence in literature showing the opposite where the application of potassium results in an increase in microdochium patch disease. Okay. So we're going to get into the details, but I want to show that because there's one or two stats nerds that I like having in my group. <laughs> and I don't want to leave them out because I like seeing the stuff. This, in this particular case, they, the authors did a very good job, very clean job of showing the ANOVA table. Oftentimes people can get lost in these and they, they did a good job in this one. But let's get to the um, reading of the results. Over the course of the six years, so six year study, I was going, I was right, no, six year study, potassium fertilization did not have any effect on the daily clipping yields of the creeping bent grass, which is what I just showed up there in the ANOVA table. Similar to the daily clipping yield, chlorophyll index and visual turf grass quality were not affected by fertilization of any treatment. And that's what I just showed right here in that one. Extremely confident. When, th when these numbers start getting down to like the 0.1s and the 0.09s and things like that, statisticians sometimes will say, well, there, there probably is a difference there. There might be a difference there. You know, if you repped it out six times or eight times or 20 times, you probably could lower that down to where it'd be below 0.5. But, you know, they'll, sometimes they'll say that. Oh, it's 0.1. Maybe there's something there. But at 0.94, you're extremely confident that there is no effect or there was no effect on turf quality from following the application of potassium in the study. Turf, visual turf grass quality ratings were often influenced by presence of disease because of the infrequent use of fungicides. In the absence of disease, turf grass quality maintained at or above acceptable levels. So if it wasn't for the disease, they'd probably be fine. But because of the disease, the star quality was declined, declined uh, below acceptable levels. Malik-3 extractable and leaf tissue K. Malik-3 extractable soil K levels were affected by treatment date and treatment times date interaction. So what that means is the Malik-3 extractable soil levels, so potassium levels, were affected by the treatment, but they're also affected by the time of year, which is what I just showed. Um, I can't remember the paper, but I showed it a couple of days ago where the potassium levels, I think it was in the COP paper, where the potassium levels decreased in Malik-3 in the spring and then increased in the summer and started to de decline in the winter. And they did that over three years. The lowest potassium levels were in the early spring. You're going to see the same thing in this paper. I'm going to show it in a minute. They have a graph and I'm going to postulate why I think that is very likely occurring and the importance to you as a homeowner, why, although this is on a putting green, why that information might be important to you as a homeowner. And if I fail to do it, put it in the text and scream at me in text and make sure I get the information. I don't want to, I don't want to forget it. Like Malik 3, leaf tissue potassium content was significantly influenced by both treatments and sampling date. So the fluctuate, so the, the tissue K was influenced by the application of, of potassium and it was influenced by the seasons throughout the year. So in other words, there was fluctuation throughout the year just just outright fluctuation in the tissue potassium okay for even without the potassium level the the, the plots receiving no potassium the tissue k fluctuated with the potassium the tissue k fluctuated with and without it throughout the year there's a lot going on there in the soil and in tissue k 
Now, let's look, I'll look at it right now. So, here's the graph I want to show you in terms of the exchangeable potassium over time from the average of all treatments receiving or plots receiving potassium and the average of the plots that did not receive potassium as a application. And what I want to point out is a couple things is, obviously, the plots that received potassium had higher tissue K. I'm sorry, higher soil K. I mean, this is malic 3 extractable soil, soil K. When you apply potassium, at higher soil K. When you didn't apply potassium, you had lower soil K. But look at, notice them on both of them. The decline occurs, the lowest point here of the applied potassium occurs right in here around May. And then the next year, as this goes down, it goes, it goes up here, which peaks at around September. And then it goes down here again around May. We're in Madison, Wisconsin. It goes up again the following year, peaks at around September 3rd, it looks like, and declines down again to about May 8th is the lowest point. It goes up and goes back down the following year. The lowest is again in May of the following year. It goes up and back down. So the lowest soil extractable potassium occurs very consistently in Madison, Wisconsin in May. If you're in different time, locations throughout the season or throughout the United States or the world, when the when you're coming out of winter, if depending on how how severe your winter is, if it's really cold, like in Madison, Wisconsin, compared to Kentucky, it's going to be more pronounced. But the soil extractable potassium has consistently been lowest in the spring and consistently been greatest in the summer or early fall. Why do you think? Why is this the case? In my opinion, soils and even even some of the microflora, microfauna, and organic issues going on in terms of de decomposition and so forth, that would have less an effect on potassium, but there's some stuff going on there. All of that is more active in warmer temperatures. So the mineralization of potassium from primary minerals is going to be related to the temperature of those minerals. So when the minerals are frozen, the mineralization of the potassium or the removal of potassium out of those primary minerals is going to be reduced. It's, this is going to be slowed. And as the temperature goes up, that, that mo the movement of that mineral out of that, the movement of that element out of that mineral is going to increase. So in the wintertime, when it's so cold, the, the release of potassium from primary minerals like potassium bearing feldspars or micas is going to be reduced. And as the temperatures go up, it increases. So why is this important to you? This is on a putting green. Why is it important for a homeowner or a sport turf person or a sod producer or a golf course superintendent? Is that if, and this goes with other elements as well, um, depending on the source of the element, like if it's nitrogen or phosphorus maybe coming from organic material, it might it'd be sort of similar, but from a different source. If you're, if you're determined or you, are, you, are, you have historically found that potassium or phosphorus is resulting in an unacceptable turf grass because it's deficient, and you're going to try to measure that on a soil test, you would want to take that soil test in the spring when the values are the lowest, not in the summertime when the values are the greatest, because the values in the greatest, let's say the, let's say the potassium in the summertime is, say, 70 parts per million. Well, this, this here is, say, 50 parts per million. And let's just say theoretically that the mainly, um, this is completely made up. This is not true. I'm making this up. Let's say the, the critical level for potassium is, say, 10. Well, if you take it in the summertime, your potassium level is 50. If you take it in the wintertime, it might be down below. Well, it's not below 10, but it might go down to below that critical level in the spring. So you're deficient at one time of the year, potentially, and not deficient at other times of the year. Well, the spring is when the turf's trying to grow. It's coming out of dormancy, coming out of that quiescent stage. It needs nutrients to put on more, you know, activity and so forth, more growth. And if it is deficient, it's going to be deficient in the spring. That's when it's lowest. So that's why it's important to you as a homeowner. When you take that soil sample, ideally, you'd want to take it when the soil uh, nutrient values or extractable levels could be the lowest. And this paper, along, along with the, I think it's Kelly Kopp's paper, both show that the concentration of at least potassium is fairly consistently the lowest in the spring going into the summer. 
Okay. Okay. So let's get to the disease stuff, which is the fun part. Dollar spot was observed in the research area every year, but data was only collected in 2013, 14, and 15. Its severity was significantly affected by date, but not by treatment. So dollar spot was not affected by treatment, but it changed throughout the year. Brown spot was also observed on three occurrences during the study and was also significantly affected by date, but not by treatment. So brown spot and dollar spot on bent grass changed throughout the year, but was not increased or decreased as a result of applying potassium. So if you want to apply on bent grass potassium with the intent of reducing dollar spot or reducing brown patch, that wasn't measured and that wasn't concluded in this paper. They didn't find it had any effect. It, what had, the only thing that had an effect was the time of year. Okay. Now let's go to the... I'm not worried about that. Well, this is the same thing with the soil test, but it's, but it's the tissue test where the tissue potassium is lowest in the same time of year that the soil test potassium was. In this case, the tissue potassium goes up to about 2% or so in September, something like that, July, August, September, and goes down in, in May, the lowest in May of about 0.5%. About, about it goes up and goes down and up and down and up and down and up and down. So if you're on a, if you're on a tissue test, you know, regime and you're trying to tissue test to determine how much potassium you need to apply, how do you know? How do you know how much you need to apply? Depends on the time of year. Well, you, you're, you're, no, your tissue potassium needs to be above 1%. It's got to be above 1%. Well, what if you take it in May in Madison, Wisconsin, it's below 1%. Well, you got to, you got to apply potassium. You got to apply potassium. Well, this study found that potassium didn't do anything to the clipping yield or the quality, even when the, the tissue K was below 1%. It didn't find it had any effect at all, even when the Malik 3 value was below, what it was a below, below 20, 20 parts per million. It didn't have an effect. The tissue, tissue potassium levels, as low as they were, 0.5%. Looks like the one here is at 0.5%. Had no effect. There was, or they had, there was no um, benefit to applying potassium even at that low level. Microdokium patch was significantly affected by treatment date and date times treatment interaction. The five pound potassium treatment had the greatest percentage of infection at 31%. Can you imagine? That's a high number. 31% on a plot is huge. That is big. So 31% of that plot was affected by microdokium at that high rate of potassium. All three rates of potassium treatments had significantly a greater microdokium patch than the uh, gypsum or the control treatments. Okay, so all three of them. And that's that photo I showed you. That's that photo right here. Okay, this photo shows, shows the results as plain as day. There's, you know, microdokium on all of them, but the control and the, and the gypsum were the same, and both of them were less than all the potassium treated plots. Very, very noticeable. Great photographs by that team, by the way. Thank you for taking those photographs. And thank you for putting on a PowerPoint, Dr. So that, <laughs> so I could use it. Thank you. Um, okay. So microdokium patch was significantly affected by infection date as well. In 2017, there was a mean disease severity of 40% total area affected while in 2015, and 16, they only had mean severities of 7 and 15%. So it was different year to year but it, in terms of the severity. But the same effect occurred on potassium regardless. In 2017, there was also a wider range of disease severity among treatments than in the other two years, ranging from 11 to 76% of the total area affected on an individual plot basis. In 2016, disease severity of the treatments that received potassium were all statistically similar, and all of them were significantly greater than the control. So year after year. Same thing, 2017, microdokium patch severity. Potassium treatments were all statistically similar, but greater than the control. Year after year, it was the same. Discussion. It was surprising to find after six growing seasons of not adding potassium to control treatments while continuing removing potassium via clipping removal, that visual potassium deficiency symptoms were not observed and yield was unaffected by am among treatments. So imagine the situation. They have 
a putting green where they're applying potassium to some plots, calcium sulfate to other plots, and nothing to a, to a control. And they're removing the clippings year after year after year, six years, continually harvesting potassium off the plots in the tissue. And yet, they never see a response to applying potassium. Okay? That's what's going on. They're continuing to apply it. Uh, continuing to apply potassium, not applying potassium to control, continue to harvest it off, harvesting potassium, and yet nothing happens. Okay. The explanation is that there is an there was enough plant available potassium inherent in the sandy soil to meet plant requirements over that time period. However, the amount of extractable potassium in the soil did not match the amount that was recorded in the plant. The mean control treatment Malik 3 extractable soil K from June and August 2011 is 33.8 parts per million. While the mean control treatment in Malik 3 extractable soil K from September and October was 24.9 parts per million. On average, Malik 3 extractable soil K was re relatively stable year to year, decreasing by about um, 1.5 parts per million soil for the control treatment. However, the mean estimated yearly K removal through clipping collection for the control was 55 kilograms a hectare per year. When assuming a 7.6 centimeter root zone and a bulk density of 1.6 grams per cubic centimeter, this translates to 46 parts per million soil per year, a removal of 30 times more K than anticipated for the Malik 3 soil values. So something's not adding up. Just sum that whole paragraph up is they're removing a lot of potassium. Okay. They're only adding in so much back more. They, they're removing a whole lot more than they're adding. But yet the soil test values aren't changing that much. It went from 33 to 24. I mean, it's not changing that much. It says, if a more conservative, if unlikely, root zone depth of 30 centimeters is used, it still indicates a removal exceeds changes in maybe three extractable potassium of a factor of eight. They're removing a lot more than they should be applying, than, than they thought they were applying. This suggests that the Malik 3 and presumably all other tests meant to measure an estimated exchangeable potassium is not a meaningful test of plant available potassium on this particular soil. How many times have you seen that written in a scientific journal article by an established, well respected soil scientist? Malik 3 is, is not a meaningful test of plant available potassium on that particular soil. And how many times have you heard me say on this channel, I don't really have that much confidence in many of these values? There are clearly cases where I do. There's clearly cases where phosphorus is. There's clearly cases where potassium can be as well. Okay. But I, it just, I, I'm just not overly confident with looking at a soil test and saying, yep, your potassium is 40, you got to apply potassium. Or your potassium is 40, you have enough potassium. I'm just not that particularly confident on it. I mean, am I confident? Yeah, I mean, a little bit, but it's, it's, it's not as if it's gospel. I mean, okay, it's not like this is the rule and, every, on, and you must follow it. The scientific consensus in this area is nowhere remotely to that degree where we would say, yes, you, these are the values you need to follow. And right here you have a publication by one of the most well-respected soil scientists in, turf grass, in the turf grass discipline saying, Malik 3 is not a meaningful test of plant available K on this particular soil. We're doing the soil test from doing measurements of taking it off, and it's not adding up. Okay. In our study, the non-fertilized controlled treat, treatment treated soil from the or treatment soil from the beginning of the study had a mean soil potassium content of 173 parts per million under the nitric acid. So now we're doing total potassium. The total potassium was 173, and a mean of 124 at the end. So it was 173 at the beginning. And 124 at the end. Uh, so uh, roughly five times higher than the corresponding Malik 3 extraction. So the total was five times higher than the Malik 3 extraction. However, even this analysis method falls well short of the adequately accounted for the potassium removed via clipping collection. So even total, in, total K did not adequately account for all the potassium we're removing. They're removing a lot more potassium than, than should have ever even been in the soil. They're removing over six years. They're removing and removing and removing. And yet, it's still doing just fine. There's a reason for that. I'm getting to it. 
It is likely that the majority of cay in our soil that was taken up by the bent grass was not accessible by even the most aggressive nutrient extraction methods, being in this case one molar nitric acid, and may be associated with potassium bearing minerals such as feldspars. We estimated the total soil potassium from the beginning and the end of the study and found 2011 soil K content was 5,704 parts per million soil, which was similar to the 5,996 parts per million soil found in the 2016 samples. Using total soil K, we observed that the total soil K content was increasing by about 50 parts per million per year, despite regular removal of potassium and clippings. So they did all this work and they found out that they're removing so much potassium, the potassium level should be going down. But the potassium level was going up by 50 parts per million a year. They're doing Malik 3 extraction potassium. They're doing total extracted potassium. How is this happening? How is it possible that we're measuring all these fates and all these sources of where potassium can go and where potassium's coming from, and we're finding that something's not adding up. We're going to get to it real quick. They actually note that the annual deposition and rainfall is not that much. They make a note of it here. Only accounted for about 6% of total K uptake. Top dressing is not thought of as a fertilization event, and right, rightly so when using traditional soil extraction methods. The annual rate of Malik 3 soil potassium additions as a result of top dressing was estimated to be an insignificant 0.9 parts per million. However, the annual rate of total soil K addition as a result of top dressing was estimated to be 720 parts per million. This indicates that top dressing is adding more than 15 times the potassium to the soil than is being removed through clipping collections. If even a small percentage of these potassium bearing minerals in the top dressing soil were made plant available over the season, they, would, they could easily account for all the potassium removed by the bent grass and regular replacement of those minerals via top dressing would ensure the supply never decreased. So they were, don't forget, they're applying about five millimeters of top dressing sand a year and from the same soil source that the green was made out of. And in that top dressing sand, it was determined there were potassium bearing minerals. And those potassium bearing minerals, if even a little bit gets mineralized from those minerals, it would easily account for the addition of potassium that they weren't accounting for in the fertility. In other words, they're not thinking top dressing is adding fertilizer, but they determined it was. They kind of, for all the sources, and they're still going up, they did not account for the top dressing sand. And when they did, all the numbers are added up and they realized that the potassium bearing minerals in the top dressing sand was more than enough to account for the additions of potassium. The addition, the further additions of potassium to the plots increased disease. So there's a lot going on here. And the take home message from a lot of this is that just because your soil test, Malik 3 or Malik 1 or whatever, is saying that you don't have enough potassium or saying that you do have enough potassium, it's not accounting for the ability of some soils to release potassium that would not be measured on that soil test. And not in this paper, but in other papers, we're going to find that some soils will actually bind potassium out of the soil solution. And that's not accounted for on soil test either. Again, Another reason why I just don't have a great deal of confidence in some of these soil test numbers. And I, I don't want to say I don't have any, but it's just there's a lot more we need to know when it comes to potassium than just one number on a soil test. Okay. The review of the relevant literature revealed that studies that report a lack of response to potassium fertilizer tend to be on sandy soils, while the studies that report responses to potassium fertilizer have been on fine textured soils of pure quartz. Of the research that reported clipping yields and visual response to potassium fertilization, the dearth of pot potassium feldspar in the soil is likely responsible for the response. So basically what he's saying is 
on the, those chance that when there were when there have been responses to the potassium fertilization, they've been on pure quartz where there were no potassium bearing minerals in the sand or in the soil. And then they happened to find that indeed the turf grass responded potassium on those soils. Okay. When they didn't find a response to potassium, it happened to be on sandy soils that may have contained potassium feldspars. So we can't go out and say your malic 3's potassium is 40, so you don't need any potassium because we don't know what soil it is. If it's a silicon sand or if it's a, if it's a sandy soil that has potassium feldspars, those are two completely different interpretations and very likely two different situations that you may need potassium for one and you may not need potassium for the other. In other words, you might need potassium in the case where you have silicon based sands where there's no potassium bearing minerals in there. Whereas the soils that have potassium bearing minerals in there, they're probably releasing some of the potassium and you might not need any potassium even if it's the exact same Malik 3 soil test value. I don't mean to make things complicated, but there, I'm just saying there's a lot more to it than just, oh, there's a number. We need to apply it. How much more do I have here? Oh, not much. Okay. I got a couple. I got a red and a yellow paragraph. That means it's really important. So let me get to those. Because there was no difference between visual response and clipping yield among the treatments, but there was a disparity among tissue potassium content, an inference can be made about minimum tissue K content required to produce results that cannot be improved upon with potassium fertilization. The controlled treatment of this study produced these results at a mean tissue potassium content of 1.2%. So that was the average, 1.2% in the tissue. That was enough. Here's, here's an important, important uh, paragraph. Because there was no significant difference between treatments. By the way, just listen up. If I didn't put it, if I didn't, if, every, if there's anybody still awake, okay, just listen up real quick. This is probably the most important paragraph of the whole paper, especially for people that are using MLSN and they think they're going to be okay and they're not wasting any fertilizer and so forth. Listen up. Finally, because there was no significant difference between treatments as related to clipping yield or visual response for this study. The lowest mean exchangeable potassium level therefore produces the same result as the highest mean exchangeable potassium level. Okay, everybody got that? The lowest produced the same as the highest. Thus, an exchangeable potassium level of 22 parts per million, Malik 3, is sufficient to produce similar clipping yields and visual response results as higher exchangeable potassium levels. So, this indicates from published properly conducted research that the critical level for this soil in this location was 22 about about a third lower about 30 percent lower maybe even more than that what is that that's 40 percent lower than the mlsn values so once again another reason why i don't follow mlsn the literature has more accurate and more precise values for your situation. If, 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 if they have it for your situation, it's going to be more precise and more efficient, meaning I'm not going to apply potassium on this setting if my soil test values are greater than 22.6. It's that simple. Whereas if it was, if you followed another methodology and it was 25 or 26 or 27, you might actually be recommended to apply potassium when none was needed and in fact not only was it not needed it actually resulted in microdochium disease okay i think you're solving one problem by applying potassium and in fact you're causing another throughout the course of the study it was observed that various turf grass diseases periodically infected the plots dollar spot and brown patch were not affected by treatment as we mentioned earlier microdochium patch was significantly affected by treatment with potassium fertilization resulting in a significantly higher percentage of the air affected than the control so it, you know, I can't, I, I don't know how much more I can stress it. If, if you think you need to apply potassium because your soil test value is, you know, on this, in this particular location is say 25 or 30. If you think you need to apply it because the MLSN says you're, be, you're below the MLSN value. What this is saying is one, you didn't need to apply it because it didn't increase quality or, or the, the yield or, or the growth. 
And two, you increase microdokium by applying it. So <laughs> I don't know how much clear evidence you need to, you know, to, to follow the published evidence in publications like this. You didn't need to apply it. And in fact, you caused more problems by applying it. Okay, 22.6 or whatever the number was, was more than enough. It was plenty to, to result in acceptable turf grass. I didn't need to apply anymore. The mechanism of this phenomenon, what, what he's talking about is the mechanism of why disease is occurring at greater potassium levels is not understood and deserving of study, which I completely agree with. I'm a little bit surprised they haven't jumped on that because Paul Koch up there is really good at that stuff like this. I imagine he could, they could figure it out, but they need money and they need funding, I'm sure. Moody and Rossi hypothesized that plants with higher levels of potassium shuttled organic acids to vacuoles for a charge balance that otherwise would have been used for respiration. Could be. I showed a, I showed a, a, a chart the other day. Let me see if I actually still have it on this. I showed, a, I showed a chart the other day that talked about apple seedlings and the presence of hormones. Here it is right here. The presence of hormones. I, I have no idea if this is valid or relevant at all. If, if pathologists are listening to this, Please consider, please consider looking at this as a possible research project because this is showing the increase of app, the the relative growth increase of apple seedlings when you go from low potassium to about a potassium in your tissue of about one percent. It goes up from very low to about one percent, but then it also goes down from one percent down to two and a half as it increases in the tissue. The relative growth goes down, so it's like it goes up and then it goes back down, but the putrescine levels, which is a hormone, was very, very high when the potassium was very low. And it was the putrescine was very, very low when the potassium got to about 1%. But then as the potassium continued to increase in the leaf, the putrescine levels also increased. So I don't know if the tissue was rotting or decaying and that's causing the putrescine to increase or if the putrescine is increasing and that's causing the rotting or decay in the tissue and that might be resulting in increased disease occurrence. I don't know, but a graph like this seems to kind of correlate with what we're seeing with the influence of potassium on diseases where we see some diseases occur more, prominent, uh, more prominently at high potassium levels and other diseases occurring at low potassium levels. You know, so I'm not a pathologist. I don't have a clue. I'm just throwing that out there as a potential project to consider working on in the future because we need to figure this thing out. Okay. Last little paragraph here. The, the, now we're in the conclusions. Creeping bent grass grown on this sand-based putting green did not benefit from potassium fertilization over six years. Potassium did not result in any benefit over six freaking years, people, at 22.6 parts per million malic 3. Potassium did not result in a benefit on bent grass. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I don't know what else to say. You know, is there ever going to be a benefit? Of course, I'm going to show you this. But there's so many examples where there's no benefit or a harmful effect. We hypothesize that this was due to the potassium requirements of the turf being met by weathering of potassium bare minerals as it was discovered that the reduction in exchangeable potassium pool was not large enough to account for the majority of plant uptake and removal. Potassium fertilization enhanced the symptom severity of microdokium patch of bent grass regardless of the rate. That's the conclusions. Straightforward. The conclusions are the application of potassium did not help the grass. They actually increased the microdokium disease. And the, the application of top dressing sand accounted for a great deal of potassium because of the inclusion of potassium bearing minerals such as feldspars in the actual top dressing material. So if you're in a home lawn setting and you have potassium bearing minerals in your soil and your soil test says it's you know medium or low, it might not be medium or low. You might have more than enough. It's just the test isn't accounting for it. Okay? It's just it's just that simple. All right, let me I'm going to put up the scoreboard and we're going to um if I can get the scoreboard open here. So the scoreboard is here. Now, this, we're going to add to this scoreboard a... Oh, I can't add to it. i got to change this real quick. 
I'm going to have to do this real quick. Hang on a second. Yeah, I can't add to that. Hang on, let me clip that out of there. We're going to add to this scoreboard bent grass. And then it's buyer 2023, I think it is, isn't it? Buyer et al. 2023 in the none column and buyer et al. 2023 in the negative column. So we're now we're gonna I'm gonna bring that back up on the screen here real quick. And we have now have one, two, three still in the positive column, all with yield. Now we have one, two, three, four, five, six in the none column, and one, two, three, four, five in the negative column. And these are not even weighted. Like I said, the majority, like say, for example, the Waddington paper, I think he said like 20 or 25% of the time there was a positive effect. 75% of the time there was no effect. So the weighting is, is not shown in this particular score, scoreboard. But we've got, one, we've got six in the none, five in the negative, and three in the positive. And yet potassium is the stress element. We've got to apply potassium. It's critical. We've got, we've got to apply potassium. What are you going to do if you don't apply potassium? The world's going to come to an end. Apply potassium. This this is a good example of the kingdom ice and the cheese. Actually, I can't remember who showed that to me. If it was if it was Super TA or Western Mass, I can't remember who 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 reminded me of that book. But you have a problem. You apply something. Let's say you have a perceived problem, like you have potassium deficiency. You apply potassium. You don't even have that problem to begin with, but you apply potassium. Then you have disease pop up because of the potassium. And you come back and go, well, now I got a disease. What do I do? Oh, you apply this this. Uh, you know, fungicide to, to cure the disease. So now you apply the fungicide to cure the disease and it's just an endless cycle of, you know, one problem, that one solution that you think is the solution causing another problem. And then you got to find a solution to that problem and that problem. Meanwhile, you didn't even need to apply the potassium to begin with. Okay. That is the turf grass equivalent of the kingdom ice and the cheese. Is it not? <laughs> I mean, come on. That's it. That's all I got on that um, on that one here. I'm going to read the, the chat real quick if I can get this. I don't know how to get this off the screen. How do I end show? Discord. Okay, I'm going to get this off the screen and see where I'm at here in the chat, and then we'll shut her down for the night. So, if you're a member, I'm going to read your chats first, just so you know. Chuck Benzing says, Dr. Shaddock's just curious, do you plan on providing any kind of evidence for wood ash as agricultural soil amendments since you are on the K topic? I don't have, I mean, it's an interesting question, Chuck. I don't have a paper on wood ash that I can think of off the top of my head. Uh, I, I guess the answer to that is probably not right now. I don't, I'm not going to do that just because I, I don't have it in the list. I have right now about 25 or 30 papers on potassium. I'm not going to go over all those. I only have six or seven more I'm going to go over before I change the topic. But, um, I don't recall any of them having wood ash in there. But if you know of a paper that has it in there, I'm more than happy to, to read it and go over it. Western Mass Turf, I think it was my friend. Oh, okay, that was somebody else. Uh, CVO Hobo. Dr. Shaddix, will you be covering turf grass diseases in the future? I have discovered my nutrient application was wrong, and I suspect my fun, fungus approach is wrong as well. Yes, I will cover diseases, and I want to make sure we're 100% clear on this. I am not a pathologist. I will screw it up real quick, okay? <laughs> um, but I will cover the literature, and I feel comfortable covering the literature. And I'll do my best to have some of the authors who are specialists in those that area on for papers that I, had, I think I will be challenged with. Um, but yes, I will cover the disease literature at some point. Right now, we still haven't gone over really phosphorus at all. We haven't even really touched on soil testing much at all. There's questions about PGRs. There's all sorts of questions lining up. But um, now that we have the memberships here, I might lean more upon the members who have decided to actually join as members to guide me on what you all think should be the next topic I go over. Right now, in April, I'm going to be off for a week and then off for the uh, clips. So I'm going to be a little hit and miss in April. Um, but then I'm... Um, planning on going on to an, into a little bit on phosphorus, but if you all, if the members say, Hey, you know, we would rather go on PGRs. I'd be more than happy to, to listen to the, to the, the channel members to get their input on that. Okay. I may put up a, a poll or something for members to, and I'll get your input. But remember when you select a topic, 
I'm not going to go over it for a day. <laughs> it's not a one day topic. I go over it for a month. My, my brain is wired in a certain way that it's a month and I'm going to be wired on that. I will say the month of April or May, um, what, mo what month is Mental Health Awareness Month? I think it's May. I can't remember. Mental Health Awareness Month is May. So in May, it's going to be a little bit different for about a week. I might go, I might do a month, but for about a week there, there's going to be a little bit of a different quirk in the content because I'm going to be going over some mental health topics as I think they might be useful for us as business owners and dealing with employees and so forth. And I'll have one episode in May that has absolutely nothing to do with Turk rest whatsoever. It's all about me personally, about um, my mental health. And I want to um, unburden myself with some um, personal challenges I've had in my life. And I think it might be cathartic and um, perhaps enlightening um, from your perspective as a, as a reviewer or listener of the show. Okay. A CVO Hobo, thank you for joining. I appreciate it. Um, Wednesday, let's see, it's Thursday. So I'll be back on Monday of next week. I think I'm here for another, I'm here for another two weeks. I'll be on two weeks, Monday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And then when I come back in April, it'll be Monday. I'll change all the Monday. I'll be only on Monday morning and then Thursday evening. And the Monday morning shows, remember, will be for members only. So if you want to participate in the morning shows, you got this week and next week to consider it. And then starting in April, the Monday morning show will be for members only. I really appreciate everybody who's joined up tonight. I have, oh, who do I have tonight um, for the music? It's, um, I can't remember who I have on for the music tonight, but I'm sure it's good. Okay, guys, I really appreciate everybody for showing up tonight. We had a good crowd tonight, 40 something people in the, in the, in the, uh, online tonight. I really appreciate it. Have a great weekend. I really appreciate everybody coming tonight. Thanks for all the members. Thanks for everybody coming in and participating in the chat. Have a great one. Be kind. I'll see you on Monday morning.